Hey, let's pray together. God, we do come to gather in your name and we stand on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. We stand in the power of Christ. It is only by the power of Christ that we exist. It is by the power of Christ that we are saved. It is by the power of Christ that we are changed. And now, God, as we've come to meet with you, would you speak to us through your word, by your spirit, as your church? We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Welcome again to Family Church. My name is Jimmy Scroggins. If I haven't had a chance to meet you before, I would love to meet you while you're here with us on the property. And uh, man, you guys braved the cold weather. weather. You fought, you scraped the ice off your windshields and uh, got the chains on your tires and came on to church. So way to go, guys. And uh, it is time to have our Bible study. Let's go ahead and get our Bibles out right now. Turn your Bibles on. Grab a Bible from the pew in front of you and open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke chapter 17. The Gospel of Luke chapter 17. We are studying through the Gospel of Luke at all of our family church locations all over South Florida for the next few months. And right now, we're in the middle of a series where we focus on money. So every January, we have a series where we talk about God's design for our money, and uh, some of you really like that, and some of you makes you a little bit nervous, and some of you are like, man, I just brought my friend for the first week, and we just talk about something else this week, and it's okay because I actually, um, I actually think when we discover God's design for our money, we discover something really important because Jesus said, where your treasure or your money is, there your heart will be also. So when the Bible talks about money, when Jesus talks about money, he's really not talking about money, he's talking about our hearts. And I hope your heart is already stirred and encouraged by what's already happened in, this morning in the room. Uh, Abby, I, I just love that Abby's here, that, that, that you guys have, have, have just said, we're going we're gonna to plant our family here at Family Church, that, that you, you're, you're, you're committing your family, your marriage, your children to partner with us at Family Church. And hundreds and hundreds of others have, have done that. And I just want to commend you and just say thank you for the gift of sharing that with our entire church family. What, what a blessing. And I want to say Bo Heyman sitting right here on about one, two, the fourth row. Uh, Bo was on the video. He's the executive director of First Care. And Bo has given his life. He's got a whole team of people. They've given their lives to uh, helping women who are in uh, difficult circumstances in regards to their pregnancies. And our goal and the goal of First Care is that we would have babies have a chance to live. We think every Every child in the womb and out of the womb, every person from womb to tomb has value and dignity and worth before God. This is an entire organization that underlines our pro-life stance as Christians and our pro-life stance as a church. So, Bo, thank you very, very much. I really appreciate that. All right, so today I want to talk about gratefulness, thankfulness. Thankfulness is so important because every one of us should be more thankful. There's not one of us in the room that is thankful enough, and all of us should be more thankful. Let me tell you about thankfulness. Thankfulness provides the foundation for generosity. Thankfulness provides the foundation for generosity, and generosity tends to be a reflection of a person's thankfulness. Generosity tends to be a reflection of a person's thankfulness. If you're a thankful person, you will be a generous person. If you are a generous person, you will be a thankful person. It's almost impossible to be a thankful person without being a generous person. It's almost impossible to be a generous person without being a thankful person. This is the posture of a heart. These things go together. And there's a story that we're going to read uh, that happened to Jesus, that Jesus was involved with. And this story isn't actually about money. This story is about something else. It's about the heart. Money's not even brought up in this story. But I hope this will encourage you to be more thankful. And I hope your thankfulness will encourage you to be more generous because all of these things will make you more like God wants you to be. Let's read from Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 11. This is the word of God. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, 
Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now, he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And this is the word of God. And all of God's people say, amen. We receive God's word today. Let's talk about leprosy. These 10 guys have this disease called leprosy. If you are a SEAL Team 6 Special Forces Christian, you've probably heard a lot of stories about leprosy because there are stories about the Bible, uh, stories about leprosy in the Bible in the Old Testament and the New Testament, but this leprosy disease is a real thing. Now, leprosy can refer to a whole category of skin diseases, some that which are relatively innocuous and some which can be very serious, but these lepers that are described in the Bible are most likely lepers who had a very, very, very serious medical problem. This kind of leprosy that they had resulted in all kinds of life, dislocation, and isolation. Leprosy is mentioned 68 times in the Bible, 55 times in the Old Testament, 13 times in the New Testament. It was a neurological disease that showed up in the skin and in your extremities. It affected your scalp and your hands and your feet First, it is analogous to what might be called Hansen's disease in today's world. Leprosy generally would not kill you, but leprosy was generally not curable or reversible. It caused degenerating tissues. It caused dead nerve endings. It caused deformed bodies. You ended up with twisted limbs and tumors all over your body. Those tumors would often ooze and they looked terrible and they smelled so someone could smell you when you were coming if you had an advanced case of leprosy. The disease was carried and transmitted by bodily fluids, blood, saliva, and mucus. And so you didn't want a leper to come near you anywhere near you where droplets or any kind of spray from their bodies could be ingested by you or, or hit land on your skin. So if someone had leprosy, you had to do what we all had to do a few years ago. You had to social distance at all times. You can read about the laws for lepers in Leviticus chapter 13. I'll make that your homework assignment. But the lepers had to actually cover their mouth when they came around other people and they had to yell, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. And that would warn people this person is a leper and you don't want this disease. Because when you got the disease, you had to isolate from everyone because it was so highly contagious. Can you imagine if you were a mom or a dad and you were holding your child and putting your child to bed and that night you saw a little patch of skin that didn't look right and you reached down and you try to touch that. How does that feel? And they said, I don't feel anything. You try to ignore it, hoping that something else was at play. But over the next few weeks and months, those patches began to de develop all over their body. And finally, you would have to take them to the priest. And the priest was trained in his training to look at your skin and figure out, is this a dangerous type of leprosy or is this something that we can live with? And if the priest said, that's leprosy, they've got to be isolated, you would have to take your precious child and realize they were destined for a life of isolation and desperation. And you would have to send your child away. And it was necessary because if the child stayed around the other children, the whole village could get leprosy. The whole family could get leprosy. A whole region could get leprosy. It could spread like wildfire. And so it was taken very seriously. And these people were isolated. So if you had the diagnosis of leprosy, you were devastated. If you were a husband, you would no longer be able to hold your wife. You would no longer be able to kiss your children. If you were a wife, you would be expelled from the family and forced to live like a beggar. And sure, the family would try to leave food for you somewhere so you could pick it up and make sure you were supplied the best they could. But it was a desperate, lonely, horrendous existence. That's what these 10 men were dealing with. Jesus 
sees these men. They come and find Jesus. They had heard of Jesus, and they said, have mercy on us. And of course, Jesus gives them some interesting instructions, doesn't he? Jesus says, go and show yourselves to the priests. Jesus gave them a step of faith to take before they were actually healed. He didn't heal them on the spot. He didn't reach out and touch them. He said, go and show yourself to the priests. After they turned and headed to the priests, then they were, they were cleansed. Jesus wanted them to exercise some faith, which is kind of an interesting thing because it just shows you that Jesus doesn't deal with everybody the same way. Have you guys noticed that in your lives before? Jesus doesn't always deal with everybody the same way. He's not gonna deal with you the way he dealt with her. And he's not gonna deal with him up in the balcony the way he dealt with you back there in the back. Jesus deals with different people in different ways. There are other stories where Jesus healed lepers and he reaches out and touches them even though he's not supposed to by the law. He touches them and heals them. These he heals from a distance. Sometimes he heals people instantly. Sometimes he gives them some instructions, something he wants them to do before they actually experience healing. In this case, he heals them from a distance and he sends them to do something before they can be healed. So don't be surprised when God doesn't do the same thing in your life that he did in someone else's life. And don't expect that God's gonna do something in someone else's life in exactly the same way he does it in your life because Jesus does what he wants, how he wants, when he wants. And this is an example of that. Well, if these guys would go show themselves to the priests and they were cleansed, the priests who had pronounced them leprous could then also pronounce them clean. And the priest could say, you're clean. Can you imagine what that would sound like if you'd been isolated from your family? You, you couldn't go to work. You couldn't go around the people that you grew up with. And you've been isolated for all of these years. And then the priest looked you over and said, wow, I don't know how this happened because it never happens. You are cleansed. You can go back to your life. Can you imagine what that was like? And so these guys, when they hear from Jesus, go show yourselves to the priests. They had to be looking at each other like, we just hit the lottery. I mean, you gotta be kidding me. We're gonna get to, we're gonna get to go, we're gonna get to go, go, go back home. And so they go and they're on their way to show themselves to the priest. They can barely contain themselves. And when they're on the way, there was one guy who looks down and he notices that he's cleansed. And instead of going to show himself to the priest, he comes back to Jesus. And you find out why he did it, because it says there's like a plot twist after the guy comes back. This guy who comes back to Jesus was a certain kind of person. You guys remember what the Bible said he was? It says he was a what? He was a Samaritan. A Samaritan. Now, if you know anything about the Bible, you know that Samaritans and Jews did not like each other. They were distantly related. There's a lot of reasons for that. We've talked about that before. I'm not going to go into it all now. But these Samaritans were from a different religion. They had altered the Jewish religion. They kind of had their own form of it. These Samaritans had become corrupt in terms of their practices, in terms of who they married and the way they the way they built their families. And so these Samaritans were considered less than they were were despised, that they, they, were, they were considered um, so not really enemies, but they were, they were considered lower class. They were considered less than by Jewish people. And this guy was a Samaritan. Now, Samaritans weren't allowed to go worship in the temple at Jerusalem. It probably dawned on the Samaritan. He probably, Jesus probably said, go, go show yourself to the priests. And they all kind of went in the gang. Yeah, let's show ourselves to the priests. And about halfway to the priest, the Samaritan probably remembered, the priest won't even talk to me. I'm a Samaritan. There's no point in me going with these other guys. The priest isn't gonna do anything for me. So he goes back to the guy who had done something for him. This guy, the Samaritan, one of the things the text is teaching us, Jesus comes for the outsider. Jesus comes for the one who's been left out, who's been marginalized. Jesus comes for the one that other people overlook. Jesus comes for the one that other people might look down on. The people who've been pushed down and pushed out, that's who Jesus pulls in and lifts up. It's all over the Bible. It's all over the Bible. Think about the story of the woman at the well. Some of you guys have heard that. The woman at the well was an outsider. She was ostracized. She was surprised that Jesus would even talk to her because she was a, guess what? Samaritan. You heard, remember the story that Jesus told of the guy who got beat up on the way to Jericho? And nobody would help him, but who ended up being his good neighbor? It was a, the good Samaritan. Think about the tax collectors that Jesus pulled in and lifted up, like Zacchaeus and 
Matthew, think about the demon-possessed young man who was so crazy, he had to live in a cemetery and they chained him up in a cemetery and Jesus cast the demons out of him and Jesus made friends with him. That's what Jesus always did. Think about Mary Magdalene. The Bible tells us that Mary Magdalene had seven demons cast out of her by Jesus and then Mary Magdalene ends up becoming one of Jesus' most faithful uh, disciples. What is Jesus doing? Jesus is always going after the outsider and the marginalized. And here's another example of it. Now, some of you in this room are thinking, uh, I'm tired of everybody talking about how Jesus always goes after the outcast because I'm not an outcast. I'm cool. I've been sitting at the cool table since I was in the seventh grade. I was at the cool table in high school. I was with all the cool people in college. Now I'm an adult. I'm one of the coolest adults you will ever meet, Pastor Jimmy. In fact, Pastor Jimmy, you're lucky I'm even in the room right now. I, I understand that. You've got it together. But I have to tell you the truth, if you don't see yourself as an outcast, then you don't even know your own heart. You don't understand that the, the disease of leprosy in the Bible is analogous to the disease of sin in our hearts. The leprosy in the body is analogous to sin in our hearts. It is the sins that we've committed against God and against ourselves and against other people that separate us from God just as leprosy separated people from their families and from their society. St. Paul talked about this in Ephesians chapter two. This is what he said. He said, remember, before you were a Christian, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of of Christ. And so if you're a Christian or you're thinking about becoming a Christian, you have to understand that sin separates you from God just as surely as leprosy separates one man from another. To that point, in Romans chapter 1, St. Paul says that a lack of thankfulness is part of what keeps people from being saved in the first place. One of the reasons a man or a woman would refuse to humble themselves and repent of their sins and believe in Christ is because they have a fundamental lack of thankfulness. It's in Romans 1, another bit of homework. Go read it for yourself. In fact, I would suggest that you cannot actually be a Christian. You cannot become a Christian or live the Christian life apart from a thankful heart to God. Well, this Samaritan leper is the one out of the 10 who came back and he was thankful. And what can we learn from his thankfulness? If you want to write some things down, if you have that program that you got on your way in, there's four things I'd love for you to write down. It's a good habit for you to get into, to write things down. We have a Bible study. Here's number one. You should learn from this story that thankfulness is a choice. Thankfulness is a choice. Ten were healed. Nine chose not to come back and say thank you. One chose to come back and express thankfulness. Now, your default setting as a human being, the default switch on your heart is switched to unthankfulness. You must make a conscious decision to be thankful. Do you know why that is? Because in our own hearts, we are all hardwired because of our sinfulness to think we deserve everything, to think we're better than we really are, to think we're really worthy, and yet being thankful means you're thanking somebody for something that you didn't deserve, that they didn't have to do for you, but they did anyway. Being thankful is a choice. Do you know there's a relationship between thankfulness or a lack of thankfulness and anxiety? Research has, researchers have discovered this link. A study from UCLA showed that gratitude actually changes the neural structures of the brain. That gratitude, when you express gratitude, it releases serotonin and dopamine. Harvard researchers published findings showing that gratitude actually uh, releases from our body toxic emotions. It reduces physical pain. It improves sleep, reduces anxiety and depression, and regulates stress. Expressing gratitude is actually physically good for your brain and your body. A more recent study showed that people tend to complain six times more than they express thankfulness. People tend to complain six times more than they express thankfulness. And to underline that, I just complained in this sermon about how much people complain. 
And the study shows that when you complain, complaining actually releases cortisol, which is the stress hormone that does all kinds of bad things in your body when you have too much of it. Thankfulness actually changes our hearts so that our anxious hearts can become peaceful hearts the way that God wants us to live. Look what St. Paul said in uh, Colossians chapter 3. St. Paul said, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. There's this relationship between a peaceful heart and a thankful heart. So if you're having a hard time with anxiety, and many of you are, in this world, a lot of young people deal with anxiety. A lot of people in the workplace deal with anxiety. Some of you have gotten medication because you struggle with anxiety. It's a real thing. I'm not saying it's a cure-all, but I will tell you if a conscious effort to be more thankful is likely to help you with your anxiety. I would suggest you, I would suggest you try it. Now, some of you are thinking, well, Pastor Jimmy, that's really hard for me to be thankful. You don't know all the bad things that I'm going through or that have happened to me. You know, it's probably easy for you to be thankful, Pastor Jimmy. It's harder for me. I know you have to work at it. You have to make a choice, which brings me to number two. Thankfulness must be cultivated. Thankfulness must be cultivated. If the default position of our hearts is unthankfulness, then we have to learn and train ourselves to be thankful. How many of you currently have or you ever have had preschool age children in your home? Would you raise your hands? Currently ever, ever have? Okay. You just tell me, did your children naturally just thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, or did you have to teach them to be thankful? Which one was it? You had to teach them, didn't you? I mean, don't you have to teach them? That's why, that's why when you give your kids something, you say, what do you say? What do you say? Well, you wouldn't have to say, what do you say, if they already were thankful. But you have to train them. You have to teach them. It's a thing. Have you ever done the thing where you give them the thing? What do you say? And then you wrestle it back from them. You ever done that? That's, that, was my, that, was my, that was my thing. I, I, if, you, if you didn't say thank you, I'm going to take it back from you. You're only like four years old. I can handle you. When you're 14, I don't know. But right now, I'm going to get those M&Ms back from you right now. You have to teach your kids to be thankful. I remember one time I was a uh, little, you know, uh, my parents, we lived in Jacksonville, Florida, and my dad was a school teacher. My mom was a stay-at-home mom, so we didn't have a lot. And uh, my parents took me and my brothers to Disney World. They had saved up to do it, and it was a really big deal for them and a huge expense for them. I don't even know how they did it. But somehow they took us all to Disney World. And I remember standing there on Main Street as a little, I was probably six or seven years old, and uh, my dad, it was hot, and uh, my dad went in, the, you know where that ice cream shop is there on Main Street in Disney World? My dad went in that ice cream shop on Main Street, and he went in there, and he brought me an ice cream cone, Heavenly Hash ice cream, and he brought it out there, and he said, son, and, and that was a treat, because my dad didn't normally do it. He said, I, I want you to have this ice cream cone. I know it's hot. And I took a lick of the ice cream cone. I didn't really like Heavenly Hash. I said, Dad, I don't really like this ice cream. He said, you don't, you don't want the ice cream? I said, no, I don't want the ice cream. He said, okay. He took it, and he ate it. <laughs> but I could tell it kind of hurt his feelings. And I felt a little bit bad, and I looked at my mom. And my mom, who was so affirming, she's just an affirming, encouraging person. But my mother looked at me. And I don't think she ever spoke to me like this ever in my life, except this one time. She looked at me and she said, you are a brat <laughs> because you are so unthankful. I was seven years old. I'm 52. 45 years later, I'm feeling bad right now telling you this story. <laughs> you know why? Because unthankfulness is a sin. It's a sin against God and other people. It's the default setting of our hearts. And that's why you have to train children to be thankful. And it's not just children. We have to train our own hearts to be thankful. You gotta remind yourself. 
Let's cultivate thankfulness right now. Are you ready? I want, I want to help you cultivate it right now. In the, in the room, just, I'm not going to get you into groups or anything, but I want you to think right now. I want three things you're thankful for here. Number one, I want you to think of a possession that you own. It's okay. I know you're like, oh no, we don't like possessions. We're Christians. I know, but you, you got, <laughs> you guys like some of your stuff, okay? So like, I want you to think of a possession that you own. It could be a home, a car, a, a, a piece of jewelry. I don't know what it is. Are you ready? You got it in your mind? A possession that you own that you are thankful for, that you are thankful that you have. Are you ready? Out loud on the count of three, say it out loud. It's okay. God likes it that you like possessions. Okay, this is, you're expressing thankfulness. Ready? One, two, three. All right, good. Now, that, those were good ones. All right, now, I want you to think of an experience that you've had in the last 12 months. And it has to be something you can say out loud. <laughs> but an experience that you've had in the last 12 months that you're thankful for. You got it in your mind? All right, let's say it out loud. You ready? One, two, three. Jesus. All right, I like Jesus. Jesus is always a good answer, you know. All right. Third, I want you to think of a person that you're thankful for, and it can't be a person sitting next to you right now. I'm not gonna give it to you that easy, man. Look, you do your romancing on your own time. <laughs> a person that you're thankful for that's not sitting next to you right now. Are you ready? Say it out loud. One, two, three. Good. You know, it's good for you to cultivate thankfulness. It's good for you to journal thankfulness. It's good for you to pray thankfulness. That one of the best things you can do when you feel depressed and discouraged and beaten down by life is to think of people and things and experiences that you are actually thankful for. And then you know what else is good? It's good to tell someone. So I, I like this idea. Jesus, Jesus, one of the reasons that the Samaritan was thankful, I think, I think he came back, he's thankful because he's healed of leprosy. I'm sure that was a really big one on his list. I think it's awesome that Jesus, as a Jewish man, loved the Samaritan anyway. And Jesus wanted to make sure that the Samaritan understood when it came to Jesus, everybody's invited and everybody's loved. And that's something that we should all be thankful for, isn't it? Aren't you glad that we serve Jesus who loves every person? Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Documented and undocumented, educated and uneducated, rich and poor, gay and straight, Married and unmarried, kids, no kids. Jesus loves us all, young and old. He loves us all. He's including all of us. I mean, there's so many things that we can and should be thankful for. And one of the best antidotes to whatever's ailing you right now is make a practice of being thankful. Cultivate it. Cultivate it. Which brings us to number three. Once you recognize what you're thankful for, thankfulness must be expressed. Thankfulness must be expressed. The leper comes, he finds Jesus. See, he was, he was yelling at Jesus across the way before, have mercy on us, we have leprosy. Now he's running right to Jesus, man. He's falling at his feet. He, he's, he's worshiping Jesus. He's thanking Jesus. That's what we should do. We should express our thankfulness. We should be expressing it. Maybe you should write someone a thank you text today. Not now, but, you know, in just a few minutes when we finish in church. Maybe you should write someone a thank you note. Maybe you should give someone a thank you phone call. Someone you haven't talked to in a while. A mentor. Someone who poured into your life. Maybe it's been a while since you've talked to them. Maybe you should call them and tell them thank you. There's a lady named Allie. She doesn't go to our church anymore. She should, but she doesn't. She goes to a different church. But anyway, Allie's my friend. And Allie uh, used to sit right, right back here. And uh, when I first moved to the area, our church was really struggling. We were struggling financially. We had our, our preschool area and everything was a mess. The carpet was terrible. The, the, the toys were old. It was just a, it was a disaster over there. And um, I, I didn't know what we were going to do. We were in debt and we didn't have any money. And we, we didn't have a lot of people coming to church back then. And we were trying to figure it out. And... Um, I just didn't know how we were ever going to get people to bring their little children to our church 
if our preschool area wasn't good, we didn't have any money to do it, and uh, Ali called me, she and her husband said, come, over, come, come by the house today when you leave work. So I went over and I drove over to Palm Beach where they lived and I went to their house and she sat down and she said, I know that you're really struggling right now and the church is struggling. I said, no, man, it is. And she said, you, you mentioned to me that you need some help with the preschool area. And I said, yeah, we do. She says, well, I don't know if this will do all, this will do some of it. And she gave me a check for $250,000, which at that moment, it was like a check for $20 million. And we were able to take that check, and you know what we did? We went over there and we repainted the whole preschool area. And we recarpeted the whole preschool area. We put all new toys on the first floor with that check. Man, that encouraged me so much. 16 years later, I can't get over what that meant in my life at that moment that she and her husband did something for the Lord. And so this week when I was preparing this talk here, I called her and I said, hey, Allie. She said, oh, I miss you so much. I said, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. Because if you did, you'd come back to our church. <laughs> I said, I, want, I, I reminded her of that story. She'd forgotten it. And I said, I'll never forget it. That's like one of the big markers in my life where God said, I got a plan for you and I got a plan for this church and we're gonna move this thing forward. Man, what a gift. And you know, thankfulness is the foundation for generosity. And generosity is a reflection of thankfulness. And one of the things that I would encourage you to do, all of you got when you came in, we gave you one of these Relentless Pursuit commitment cards. I'm not asking you to turn it in today. I'm not asking you to turn it in tomorrow, but I hope that this is your church, that every one of you is making a plan to express generosity to your church, to, to fund the ministry of your church. Now, our church is financially strong, and we have a lot of people that give money, and many of you do, but I'd encourage you to get involved financially and make a plan to fund the ministry of your church, and we'll talk more about that next week, but your thankfulness ought to be expressed. Last thing, number four, thankfulness must have the right object. Thankfulness must have the right object object. Did you see that the Samaritan who got healed of leprosy knew who to go and thank? He, he went and thanked the one who actually healed him. He went and thanked Jesus because Jesus saved him. And I'm going to tell you, Jesus didn't just fix his leprosy. Jesus did more than that for this one. I don't know what he did for the other nine, but for this one. And here's how I know it. Jesus tells him at the end of the conversation, at the end of the story, the story closes when Jesus says, go, your faith has made you well. Some translations of the Bible would say, go, your faith has saved you. Let me tell you why. The Greek word translated saved or made you well is the word sozo. The word sozo can, it's a semantic range. It can mean healed you physically or it can mean saved you spiritually. I'm pretty confident in this case, Jesus is telling him both. Your faith has made you well, but your faith has saved you. Not just his way of life, not just let him go home, saved his soul. And that's why the leper was thankful to Jesus. Are you thankful to Jesus? Do you understand that Jesus was crucified on the cross for your sins and God raised him from the dead and God has given you the opportunity to have all of your sins forgiven for you to be restored to God at no cost to you. All you have to do is turn from your sins and receive Jesus by faith. And if you do that, he saves you. Last story, I heard a story this week of a very successful attorney, very wealthy, influential person, but he was dying of cancer. He was not a religious guy, but he had a friend who was a Christian. And his friend went to see him when he was dying, and his Christian friend said, would you like for me to bring my pastor over here to talk to you before you die? His friend thought for a minute. He said, no, no, I wouldn't. I haven't paid any attention to God for all of these years. I'm not going crying to him now. 
Haven't paid God any attention for all of these years. I'm not going crying to him now. What a mistake. What a mistake. It's never too late for you to run to God. It's never too late for you to do what the lepers did. God, have mercy on me. And it's never too late for you to go to Jesus and express thankfulness to him for what he's done. Hey, God loves you. And God wants to heal you. And Jesus was crucified for you so that you can be sozoed, saved, healed, just like that Samaritan leper. And to remind us of the goodness of God and what God's done through his son Jesus for us, we take the Lord's Supper every Sunday at Family Church and we're going to do that right now. Now, the Lord's Supper is a ritual where we remember the body of Christ when we eat the bread, and we remember the blood of Christ when we drink the cup. The Lord's Supper is for believers in Jesus. If you're here today and you're not a believer in Jesus, I don't recommend that you take the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, we teach and we believe at Family Church, is for people who have been baptized and who are part of a neighborhood church. If you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus, you're baptized, but you're a part of a neighborhood church, but it's not this church, it's okay, we would encourage you to take the Lord's Supper with us as part of the extended family of Jesus that goes around the world. But right now, let's reflect and let's be thankful to God. Let's confess our sins. Let's draw close to God. Let's renew our faith, and then we'll eat and drink the Lord's Supper together. Thank you for worshiping with us at Family Church at Home. Right now, all our in-person neighborhood churches are about to take the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a family meal for those who are baptized believers. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and would like to take the Lord's Supper, please check out a neighborhood family church near you by planning your visit at gofamilychurch.org next Sunday. Do you need prayer today? Do you wanna connect with Family Church? Then scan the QR code on your screen to fill out our digital connect card. Someone from our team will reach out to you this week and help you connect to a neighborhood church near you to find community. Have an awesome week, Family Church.